Sounds good. Okay. Um, all right. So, hey, everyone. Um, thanks for signing up for this workshop slash, yeah, I guess it's a workshop. Um, my name is Vidu. Uh, a bit about me. I did my undergrad. I'm from Canada. I did my undergrad at Western in genetics. Um, I graduated in 2017. Um, and then ever since then, I've been working here in uh, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic um doing research and um a bunch of other things um and then this fall i'll be starting law school um, with an interest in doing intellectual property um and becoming a patent attorney uh, so if you ever have any questions about that <laughs> which i doubt many of you will uh, just let me know um feel free to just enter questions in the chat um or just blurt them out um also if you want to just have your I would encourage people to have their cameras on just so it doesn't feel like I'm talking to uh, to, to, to nobody. Um, but yeah, hope you enjoy it and, and feel free to interrupt me uh, as I go along. So um, obviously we need to develop our scholarly writing skills um, at the university level. Um, you know, you're writing lab reports, essays, um, posters, poster presentations. I don't know how far along each of you are in your undergraduate education, but I'm sure you've all come across um, some form of scholarly writing at some point. Um, also, more in a professional setting, um, you're required to write a cover letter and effective emails and really just hone your communication skills uh, in terms of writing. Um, but in terms of looking beyond your current writing tasks, what types of other communications do um, professionals and professors, oh, we have someone popped in, um, what sort of writing tasks do professionals and professors um, and experts need to write about? Um, so the answer to that is, you know, uh, papers, books, um, book chapters, lectures, um, really uh, recommendation letters, all sorts of different professional writing uh, pieces that um, uh, uh, professors and professionals put together. Um, and so after you graduate, these are all sorts of things that hopefully you'll be required to produce um, and uh, you know it's important to kind of start holding these skills early on um, uh, before you get to that point um, so pretty much uh, there's no clear um, uh, answer to writing really today the point is to just teach you a few different skills about scholarly writing that hopefully you can take over the next four years um, and so we'll be going over kind of the elements uh, of what uh, kind of a paper looks like um, and some of the do's and don'ts of, of an academic piece of writing. Um, so before we kind of get into the nitty gritty, we want to just take a step back and look at the overall picture. Um, so typically uh, writing in STEM does revolve around publishing scientific papers. Um, a lot of students enter research with the aim of publishing one to two papers to help boost their career applications to med school or graduate school. But publications aren't just there to strengthen your resumes and CVs. Um, it's a great way to uh, share information, um, no matter how large or small with the scientific community. Um, and I think that's a great way to think about, uh, you know, publishing in general, you know, it's not something you're doing to add to your CV. It's kind of a way of engaging with the world around you. And if you can kind of see um, that academic piece of writing that you're producing as part of kind of this larger puzzle um, and this broader, you know, this contribution to like the, the bigger picture, I think it makes you just like more engaged with the work that you're doing and you don't really, see, you see it more than just a means to an end. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for that. So we're gonna talk about something called ORCID. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. Um, but I have a small video that we can watch here. Um, sorry, we can't hear the noise you you or the sound. You might have to sh reshare with sound. Oh, you can't hear yeah. it. No. Oh, okay. How can I? Because I have. How can I play mm -hmm. it with sound? Sorry. You uh, just have to stop. Oh, sorry, Sirojini, go ahead. Oh, oh no, it's okay. Um, so when you share the screen at the bottom, there should be an option that says share audio as well. And so once you enter that screen, you just click on that and then you click on the screen that you want to share. Okay. Share computer sound. Is that the one? Uh, 
Okay, let's let's yes, try this out. Yeah, okay, that's, that's the one. That's the All one. Right. Meet Sofia Maria Hernandez Garcia. She is an active and accomplished scholar in her field. She does research, writes and publishes, teaches, speaks at conferences, the things that most researchers and scholars do throughout their career. She has done her work at several different organizations and has been fortunate to receive grants to support her research. Sophia wants to concentrate her time and energy on her scholarship, though sometimes things get in the way. Funding organizations want to review her past work before making an award. Her institution needs her to provide a complete list of her works for her promotion review. Potential collaborators are trying to figure out if she is the Sofia Garcia they're looking for. The Internet, repositories, and other resources can help answer some of these questions, but they all have the same core challenge. They attempt to link research activities and researchers based on the spelling of a person's name. As individual as we each are, our names are actually not that unique. Even in the same field or institution, there can be others with similar or even the exact same name. And it can get even worse if you consider all of the potential variations of a name. Names can change over time, are sometimes expressed in different ways in different situations or languages. So when someone searches for Sophia, they may or may not find all and only the things that can be attributed to her work. Today, many institutions and agencies solve this problem with paperwork. They ask Sophia to fill in forms, to list her works and include her affiliations and funding history. Some may even ask her to list her collaborators along with their past work, affiliations and funding, what is related to Sophia's work and what is not. There has to be a better way. ORCID IDs are unique and persistent identifiers specifically for researchers, analysts and scholars. With an ORCID ID, Sophia can clarify what activities are hers, regardless of how her name is expressed. Sophia registered for a free ID at the ORCID.org website. ORCID is a nonprofit organization that allows our users to control what data are linked to their identifier and how those data are made public, shared with a limited group, or made private. The community may access data made public by our users for no fee and also attach it to her organization and any new public research activity she engages in, such as publishing a paper, releasing a data set, or applying for a grant. With the ID attached to her activities, it makes it easier for people, institutions, and systems to figure out which activities are Sophia's, even if her name doesn't always appear in the same way, distinguishing her from others with the same or similar name. ORCID IDs are collected and used internationally by many institutions, including publishers, repositories, professional associations, universities, funders, and research organizations. In addition to attaching her ID to new activities, Sophia can allow these organizations to read her ORCID record to get her already curated list of past activities. Best of all, if Sophia leaves her current institution, the ID travels with her along with the list of all of her past activities. She can continue to use the same ID throughout her career, even if she changes employers, moves to another country, or starts to do work in another field. By linking the ORCID ID to her work when submitting a manuscript, applying for a grant, or registering for a meeting, Sophia ensures that the organization she works with can get the information they need with less paperwork for her. It means people will find all and only her work when they search the Internet. Sophia can spend her time concentrating on what matters most, and that makes her very happy. Get your ORCID ID today. It only takes 30 seconds to register for one and is completely free. ORCID, connecting research and researchers. All right, does anyone have any questions about that? before we move along. All right, I guess that's no question, sounds good. All right, so um, just a quick summary, Sasha will go through a kind of a review of, of what the, that video talked about. So basically it provides, ORCID provides an identifier for individuals to use with their name as they engage in research, scholarship, and innovative activities. Um, and as the video demonstrated, it can be particularly useful for researchers with a common name. 
or for a person with numerous research and scholarship activities. Um, uh, and a few, few of you might be wondering how many people actually use ORCID um, and where would your ORCID ID even come in handy? Um, so as of just this year, um, there are approximately 13.3 million ORCID IDs. Um, and today ORCID is being used by research institutions such as Caltech and publishers such as Elsevier, Springer, Wiley and Nature Publishing Group. Um, and the, these publishers, um, own the rights to several journals. Um, so um, as you can imagine, you know, a, a large number of journals are using ORCID. And I, I wouldn't, I mean, from personal experience, I would encourage you to use ORCID because even my name itself has not been spelled the same, uh, not spelled incorrectly, but on different publications, sometimes my middle name is not there. Sometimes my middle name is fully there. Sometimes it's just an initial. And so if I Google myself and try to look for my publication, sometimes all like they don't come up. So um, I, and I have a pretty like not, you know, um, common name. So for people who do have a common name, it's, it's even more problematic. Um, and so the nice thing is, is that you can start early um, with ORCID because the, the kind of the, the difficult thing about ORCID is that you can't, sometimes you can't add publications after the fact. So the earlier you start, it's good to link it before something gets published because for whatever reason, um, sometimes you can't publish it. You can't link it afterwards, um, which is kind of annoying. Um, yeah, anyway, so um, right now um, uh, you wanna basically uh, include your education uh, at this point as students in your ORCID ID. Um, some of you also might be working a job and if it's academically related, you can enter that too. Um, and then if you've also ever received a scholarship award or any sort of funding, you can also include that uh, in your funding section. Um, and kind of as the video talked about, you can include funding is another aspect of, of what you can include in your ORCID ID. Um, so just a couple of tips to maximize your ORCID exposure. First is be specific in your job, uh, job slash rural titles, um, type in relevant keywords. Um, so obviously, you know, ORCID is used by researchers, so don't put in research, put in, you know, uh, like your field of interest or um, the field that you are uh, kind of an expert at. Um, if you do link your website, make sure that it contains information that you would like to be professionally linked to. Um, so if you have any, you know, photos or stuff like that, you want to make sure they're professional. Um, you could also put links to your CV. Um, you could include uh, posts detailing your research project, uh, things like that. Um, and then also you can choose your shared settings. So similar to social media websites, such as Facebook. All right, what happened there? <laughs> uh, uh, we believe it might have been your connection. Yeah, I think that's what happened. Okay, let me uh, get everything shared again. Oh, no worries. All right, is that good now? That's good. All right, perfect. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. Where did I freeze or where did it drop off? Um, so you were talking about just right after your speech about how you can use these for jobs as well. Okay, okay. And then you were talking and then it just cut. Did you, okay, all right. Did you hear what I said about maximizing your work exposure? I believe we heard some of it. I don't okay. know, was it clear for the rest of you? I can repeat it if uh, if people didn't hear it. Let yes. me know. Yeah, maybe you can right. repeat it, yeah. Okay, yeah. sure, I'll repeat it. All right, I'll, I'll go over it quickly. So yeah, first thing um, to maximize your exposure, be specific in your job roles and titles. Um, also include relevant keywords. So um, don't, you know, everyone who's using ORCID is a researcher. So don't put uh, research as a keyword, put the field uh, that you're either an expert at or fields that you're interested in or that you published on things like that. Um, you can also include links to websites. Um, you can include your CV. You can include um, posts detailing the specific research projects you're working on. Um, and then also you can choose the different share settings that you have uh, similar to like social media. Um, but again, in my experience, um, you know, it's, it's, that's not really kind of a major aspect of, of what people use ORCID IDs for in terms of using it as kind of a, a social media platform. It's more so just used as a kind of how the video talked about as a way of identifying researchers and, um, tracking your publications and, and things like that. 
All right, so um, by joining the international scholarly community through ORCID, um, you as an individual can start with positioning yourself as an investigator and researcher. Um, so how do scientific papers gain recognition and how do you measure a paper's impact? And you, some of you might've heard some of these terms before, um, but I'll quickly go over them. So at the journal level, you have the impact factor. Um, the impact factor is basically a measure of the frequency with which the average article in a particular journal has been cited in a particular year or period. Um, and since it eliminates bias, it's useful in comparing different journals such as large journals over small ones or frequently issued journals over less frequently issued ones and of older journals over new ones. Well, um, I don't know if I, yeah. So, I mean, that's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, at the author level, we have the H index. Uh, the H index is to quantify an individual scientific research output. And the index is based on the set of the researchers most cited papers and number of citations that they have received in other people's publications. Before the H index, authors were evaluated based on the number of papers each year or the total citations from publications. Um, quality was not taken into account um, or the impact factor exclusively, which meant uh, more so for journals than for individual researchers. So the H index, a little bit more about that. It combines quantity and quality, productivity and influence. It also encourages consistency in citation numbers by favoring continuous streams of papers with lasting and above average impact. So a way of understanding H index is it's the highest number of papers a scientist has that have at least that number of citations. So one second. So a scientist has index H, if H number of their papers have at least H citations each and the other papers have no more than that number. So if some, so example, Professor Lee has index, has an H index of 15. If 15 of his papers have at least 15 citations each and the other papers have no more than 15 citations each. So papers gain recognition through citations and references in other scholarly publications. But, in that, but now in today's day and age, scholarly communication is changing. So this alt metrics, we'll kind of talk about this for a little bit. Um, this kind of takes into account kind of, uh, you know, the new age of how we disseminate and talk about uh, information, which, you know, includes social media and all that kind of stuff. So a research output is mentioned online every two seconds. It could be a paper tweeted among academics on Twitter or a paper cited in a newspaper article being shared on Facebook or talked about in the evening news. So if we follow this infographic and do the math, that's 44,000 new mentions per day and around 50 individual research outputs are shared or mentioned online each week. So how do we monitor the impact that research is having in real time? This is where alt metrics come in. And so we will uh, go through a video. Um, Sorry, we have a question from Mimuna. Um, she asked, I'm just gonna repeat it in case no one's reading the chat. Um, being a third author or like any number below that, can that negatively affect the author when like applying for stuff uh, and you share your research paper? Sorry, I'm drinking so much water. Like I've been, I have, I have had, I've had like three flights over the next, over the last five days. And I'm just like super thirsty. So I'm just like, everything's really dry. Um, no, absolutely not. So uh, to answer your question, no, I mean, being involved in any capacity in research uh, is, is a good thing. And you would never get, you would never get penalized for being like, you know, uh, further down the author list on a paper. Um, obviously, you know, it's better to be a frontline author, but that just has more to do with kind of, um, you know, that the amount of work you put in, that's typically how or how, how authorship should be decided. Um, but in terms of, you know, where you are in the authorship, I mean, um, that that would never be that would never have a negative impact. Um, obviously, you know, a paper where you're like, let's say you're applying, speaking to what you're asking, if you're applying for stuff, if you're like fifth or sixth or seventh or something, or, uh, you know, kind of. Sorry. 
Uh, okay. Anyway, um, if you're you know not a first line author, if you're applying for something, you know, or uh, in, you know, in general, that paper is not going to look as impressive as if you are a first line author for you know first, second, third, something like that. Um, but that's okay. I mean that that's not that's not necessarily a negative impact. That's just that's just how it is in terms of you know how people see um, you know uh, particular things on your resume. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, cool. Anyway, so I'm gonna go through a quick video here on altmetrics. Let me know if you can hear the video. In this video, we'll share a beginner's guide to altmetrics. This is Grace. Grace is a biologist who is about to go up for tenure. In her dossier, she's expected to share evidence of her community outreach efforts, but she doesn't know where to find this evidence. Where can Grace learn how her books, articles, data analysis software, and other research are being used and discussed by many different diverse types of people, including the public and policymakers? Grace asks her mentor, Dr. O'Reilly, for advice. And Dr. O'Reilly introduces Grace to the idea of altmetrics, a new, better way to understand all of the potential impacts of research. Altmetrics are data sourced from discussion happening online around research. Because more people are using the web to communicate with each other in their everyday lives, more research is also being shared, discussed, rated, recommended, reviewed, and read online. That means that the use and discussion of research that was previously hidden is now more discoverable than ever before. Altmetrics can potentially be gathered from any online forum where research is being discussed. That includes social media, research blogs, public policy documents, news articles, and more. The possibilities are endless. These online interactions in the aggregate provide a lot of data that can help researchers like Grace discover the specific, meaningful examples of online engagement. For example, when policymakers have recommended changes to healthcare treatments that were first mentioned in a research article, when a researcher has praised a book on a blog read by thousands of other microbiologists worldwide, or when doctors reference research on Wikipedia to help other clinicians understand a disease. Some experts have called these types of evidence flavors of impact. Based on altmetrics, research has been found to have many flavors of impact beyond the kind you can discover using citations alone. These flavors can include research's impact upon education, policy, and more. Altmetrics can help us fill in the gaps that citations alone can't address. For that reason, they're meant to complement, not replace, citations. Experts agree. Altmetrics are useful in combination with other metrics and expert peer review for helping us understand the potential impacts of research. They're meant to supplement, not supplant, existing forms of research evaluation. Altmetrics can potentially be applied in any situation where you need to understand research's attention, influence, or impact. And for that reason, they're a great fit for grace. Now, Grace knows that Altmetrics can help her find solid evidence for her tenure dossier. Want to learn more? Visit altmetric.com to check out our beginner's guide to Altmetrics and to find free tools that can help you find your own Altmetrics. All right, does anyone have any questions about that? Oh yeah, also sorry to cut in, but um, just uh, keep in mind all to keep your mics off unless you have a question. Um, thank you. There's a spot. It's not marked by. <laughs> sorry. All right, cool. I'm going to skip over this part because I think we're, it's, it's not really relevant. So, okay. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about what actually goes into a manuscript. Um, before I continue, how many of you like have experience going through like a journal article or have experience writing a journal article, kind of what, where, where you are with, with uh, your comfort level with this. You can put it in the chat or you can say it out loud. Okay, read a bunch. Yes, <laughs> yes, I'm get, okay, sounds good. <clears throat> okay. Couple people responded. All right, so yeah, so we'll just talk a little bit about um, 
you know, what goes into a paper. So um, looking at an example manuscript, in order for you to be picked up by blogs, mainstream media coverage, um, and so on, choosing the right and relevant keywords are necessary to help your paper be discovered and increase its impact factor. Um, so the first thing, key things that we encounter at first glance are the, obviously the keywords, um, the title and the abstract. So looking at the title first, um, this is what many readers will see and many people will judge your entire article by it, despite the old phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. Um, so this means that you need to select the words in the title with great care. So when it comes to title, you wanna make sure the title is specific. Um, what are the dependent and independent variables being tested? And is there a clear trend or result that emerges? Are you working on a specific organism, meta or location? Um, use the fewest possible words to describe the contents of your, contents of your paper. So yeah, typically, um, you know, with a title you have, um, it's kind of an expression of kind of the major finding of your, uh, of your scientific work. Um, you would mention the name of the organism, you would mention the disease, for example, you would mention um, kind of what your main finding is. Um, but obviously, you know, brevity is key. You want to make sure that it's nice and short. Um, and so, you know, um, and, you know, some journals have like, they have certain word limits or character limits um, on titles. Um, and so those are things also you need to kind of keep track of and abide by uh, when you're publishing something. So uh, the next thing you come across is the abstract. Um, and the abstract is basically uh, your chance to hook your reader in. Um, and at this point, the reader has not read the rest of your paper. So this is meant to be a brief summary. So I'm sure, uh, you know, a lot of you have been on PubMed, things like that. Um, and when you're looking at papers on PubMed, you know, the abstract is kind of what will come up uh, when you click on a paper. And it, it's, it's really your first pass kind of at determining whether that paper is of, of relevance to, to whatever you're trying to uh, learn about or write about. And so you want to make sure that, you know, you do write your abstract with a lot of intent. Typically, um, you know, abstracts you'll write kind of at the end um, as kind of the final piece of, of your paper, um, even though it comes right at the beginning, just because it's, it's um, you know, the rest of your paper needs to get fleshed out before you actually write your abstract, because your abstract is going to be, you know, only like 100 or two or 300 words. Um, and so according to the American National Standards Institute, a well-prepared abstract enables readers to identify the basic contents quickly to determine whether the paper is relevant to their interests and decide whether they need to read their paper or not. Um, and so as an author, you are trying to deliver the main points in a concise paragraph. Um, and essentially you would state the purpose or aim of the paper, the methods used, the major trends, values, and your principal conclusions. Um, and yeah, some pointers about um, abstracts, you know, don't include like too many technical terms or abbreviations. Um, and you know, there's not too much discussion going on in your abstract. It's really just stating kind of like your, your main findings, um, maybe one intro sentence, things like that. Um, another important thing to note about abstracts is that every journal has their own requirements for um, what should be in an abstract. So typically, um, you know, you an abstract might be like an introduction, uh, methods, results, conclusion. Um, they would want you to split it up. But then there's some journals where, where they have like eight or 10 different sections of their abstract, which are only going to be like a line each, but, you know, they have it more kind of specific. So they might have like the setting, the patient population, the, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever. Um, and so again, pay attention to what they have, um, how they have that set up. Um, and yeah, so for the keywords, um, you might think that keywords are not a big deal um, and you might just pick a few at random that represent your paper, um, but that's not true at all. The, generally the best keywords are the ones that can answer the following questions. What is your paper about? What techniques designs were used? Who and what is studied? Um, and again, try to focus in on the major nouns and verbs uh, of the paper. The truth is picking relevant keywords um, is that they will give your paper that edge as we've seen through the alt metrics earlier. Um, and yeah, you know, we've been talking kind of about um, titles and keywords and things like that. And so um, the point about that is, you know, uh, a strong piece of scholarly writing isn't just about the words you write or type. It's also about how you present your work, 
work, um, a strong title, a relevant abstract, uh, simply following formatting standards. These things make all the difference and can literally make or break your paper. Um, all right. So yeah, now we'll actually talk about some of the writing. So we'll talk about the intro first. So um, the intro is actually, you know, very, very important. Um, so the way that it's typically organized, think of it kind of like an inverted triangle. Um, you want to start off broad with kind of the general background information. Um, you want to define relevant terms. Um, and so let's say we're writing a lab report or I guess a piece of uh, scientific writing about enzymes. So first um, you would define kind of what is an enzyme. Um, you want, might want to define uh, terms such as turnover rate, catalytic efficiency, um, the mckills mentons con Actually, you know, I'm, I'm gonna edit this a little bit. So, you know, actually, you know, if you're writing a journal article, because we're talking about journal articles, if you're writing a journal article about um, uh, a particular enzyme that you're studying and the function of the enzyme, you're not gonna define what an enzyme, enzyme is. You're not gonna really define any of these terms. That's, that's not something that you're actually gonna do. Um, you would define it with perhaps within the context of that organism that you're studying, or you would define what the function of that particular enzyme is that you're studying, but you would not go out and define an enzyme. No one actually does that. Um, just, yeah, just pointing that out. Um, and yeah, the next thing we wanna do is include a brief literature review. And the reason we do a literature review is because the introduction you know, serves two main functions. The first function is to kind of catch up the reader on where that particular field is at. Like, you know, what, what, are, the question, what are the questions that have been answered? What are the questions that have not been answered? Um, and then the second piece of it is to kind of, you know, fit in what, define what you're studying and kind of help explain why it is that you conducted this study. Really think of it like you're trying to kind of plug, plug a hole essentially. Um, and then within that, you were also gonna define the purpose and objective of your study. Um, you know, include any hypotheses and predictions um, and be very clear about that because, you know, people need to understand and, uh, you know, one of the things that Im increases the impact of your study is that people really need to understand, you know, why it is that you did this study. Why does it matter? That is something that you're going to talk about briefly in your introduction. You have to very clearly spell out, okay, like, you know, we've gone from point A to point B. Now, how do we get from point B to point C? And that is what our paper is trying to do. Um, and obviously, you know, it's nice to have an, like a meaty introduction with a ton of references, just to show that you've really done your research um, uh, of, of prior, previous literature um, and you've included a ton of references and all that kind of stuff. Um, and again, writing the introduction is, a, a kind of, this is kind of a sidebar, but writing the introduction is a really good way of really familiarizing yourself with the literature um, because sometimes, you know, especially when you're an undergraduate student or a graduate student, you're conducting experiments and things like that. Um, uh, but you, you might not have a very strong grasp of kind of the bigger picture of, of whatever it is that you're studying. And so if, if you do get involved in writing a paper, um, I would say, you know, try offering up to write the introduction because, um, you know, an introduction is, is something that you can probably you know, handle better as an undergrad uh, versus like writing the discussion where you do need to have kind of this deeper knowledge of, of, uh, of the subject matter. Um, and it's a really great learning exercise because by writing the intro, you're just gonna get a really good idea of, of what that field is kind of at a broader level. So um, I would encourage you to, when you, you know, go into research opportunities and things like that. Don't always think about, okay, I wanna write a paper. I wanna write it like all by myself or like things like that. You know, that's, those opportunities are hard to come by as an undergrad, um, even as a graduate student. Think about it, like how, what pieces of it can I complete? And I would say that the intro is one of those, one of those pieces that I think people who don't have a lot of research experience can offer up help for. Um, and we can talk more about that kind of stuff um, at the end. So a few do's and don'ts. Uh, do's define relevant terms includes what's necessary for the reader to understand the context of the paper, clearly state the purpose and cite all your references. Don't, in, don't introduce unrelated information, uh, mention results or conclusions, that's very important. Um, restate the same information multiple times, that's obvious. 
and uh, hide your purpose of your, or objective within a paragraph. You want to be very clear about your purpose, which I already talked about. Um, so how can you find relevant papers? Um, you know, this is kind of what I was talking about here. Your intro is kind of a literature review. So how do you conduct a literature review? So it's easy to feel overwhelmed with the amount of information that is available, and it may be hard to pick what's relevant. So a good rule of thumb in selecting what to include is what it, include what is necessary for the readers to understand the context of your paper and introduce information that you do want to expand on further in the discussion section. And we'll talk a little bit more about that second point. Um, alternatively, you might have a different problem, which is to uh, not be able to find any relevant papers. Um, so a couple of different ways, you know, you can use Google, you can use PubMed, um, you could use your university's online library. Um, but I know these days um, there are, uh, you know, kind of fancier tools to find papers uh, that are relevant to your area. So there's a website called iris.ai. And basically, you can look up a particular paper. So I'm going to put in this paper here. And what it's going to do is it's going, this is the paper here. And it's going to create a map, essentially, of all the different um, related papers by keyword. So these are kind of the papers uh, 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 that are related to this particular journal article. And so if you go in here, there's these kind of like, think of, it's kind of like a word cloud almost, and it'll show you papers within that area. So if I go to like consumption, um, there's all these different papers within here that it shows that are related uh, to that particular um, uh, uh, paper that you're looking at. I personally have not used a tool like this before. Um, I'm old school and just use PubMed and, you know, kind of, you know, slum it out like that and figure it out. But, um, you know, if you want to be fancy and try these things, you can totally go for it. It's, it's really up to you. Um, personally, <clears throat> what I like to do, honestly, um, is, you know, if I want to learn, and this is kind of the way I do it, and you don't have to, you don't have to take it, but if you don't want to use these fancy tools, you know, because this is, this is a lot of, of information that, that is being thrown at you. And for example, you might not want to look at a paper that was published in what, there's like one, yeah, 1992, like that's like, that's like 30 years ago, no one's going to read that. So um, a good way to do it is I like to kind of find like seminal review articles um, on a particular topic and like nature publishes really good reviews, um, things like that. Um, and reviews are a really nice way to not just learn about a topic, but they in fact will cite and summarize all the major um, articles uh, related to that subject area um, that are kind of the main articles in that field. And they will do it in a nice chronological way um, and then you can kind of, of replicate that and, and write your introduction um, kind of using that and picking and choosing the papers that you think um, are relevant. Because at the end of the day, you know, um, no matter how fancy these tools get, you have to make it make sense in your head. You have to be able to understand what to leave out and what to uh, leave in your introduction. No one's, no tool is going to make that decision for you. So um, you want to make sure that, you know, you find a way that works for you. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of my two cents about that. All right. So in terms of references, um, just a quick note, um, please cite everything. You don't want to be accused of plagiarism or academic dishonesty, especially, uh, you know, in, in academic writing, um, and self plagiarism is a thing, you know, uh, like um, I just submitted two different papers and you know I used the same table for both papers but I had to like jumble one up to make it not look like the other one it was even though it was like the exact same information just so that the one journal doesn't freak out about it so self-plagiarism is plagiarism is a totally a thing that you have to avoid so please you know make your life easy and don't plagiarize and also if you do not use figures and tables uh, without permission from the paper. Figures and tables are included in, in that whole sphere of plagiarism. Um, typically, you have to purchase the copyright to a figure or a table from, uh, from the paper that you're citing. 
from if you want to use it kind of as is or you want to recreate it kind of thing. Um, so just be be aware of that. You can't just take a figure from something and, and put it in your paper. That, that's not how that works. <clears throat> okay, so as for um, citations, there are tons of ways to um, organize references. There's always, there's ReadCube, Mendeley, Zotero. Um, in my experience, most people you like I, I don't know in my experience most of the people that I work with use EndNote um because it, it, it integrates really nicely into Microsoft Word. Um and so I would I would encourage using EndNote because it, it is really great. Um but I know it might cost money. Um so I'm not sure but if you're working within the institution or whatever you probably will will get access to it. Um, but yeah I think EndNote is really great and it's something that every a lot of people use um but yeah okay cool so materials and methods um this is pretty straightforward um you know here you're pretty much just defining um kind of you know the the how you conducted your experiment you know how pretty much what you learn in school you know what allowing someone to pick up your paper and be able to replicate the results um or do this conduct the study the way that you conducted it so what reagents were used what cell lines were used all that kind of stuff um, so yeah, quickly, main do's and don'ts, uh, include relevant figures or flowcharts. Um, these are, you know, a lot of the times included in the supplemental information of the journal article, um, you know, and I, that's why I would encourage all of you to try and read the supplementary material when, when you have time, because it will help you understand the paper a bit, a little bit better, because journals have a limit on how many figures and tables you can include in the main body of your article um you know some might only allow like three figures and two tables or something like that so that doesn't mean that all the other stuff that they did is not important it just means that they literally could not include it and so they had to toss it into the supplementary so i would encourage you to read the supplementary um because it will just strengthen your understanding of what it is that you're reading um yeah again include sufficient detail to allow for replication be brief and concise brief and concise um, and some don'ts, um, describe common or established techniques in detail, state obvious ideas, use I or we. Um, yeah, in terms of describing common or established techniques in detail, um, yeah, you're not, you're not writing like, oh, you know, step one, we did this, step two, we did this, step three, it's not like that, you're just kind of diff like, again, pointing out what cell line you use, what reagents you use, what, you, what if you were treating cells with a particular drug, what, um, you know, what dosing regimen did you use? Things like that, that are critical for people to understand the paper. Um, all right, so results, uh, this is a pretty easy section, um, but again, how you present your data and being concise are very important. Um, and so first we're gonna talk about uh, the writing portion of it, and then also the figure figures part of it. So. Um, when it comes to figures and tables, you want to make sure that they are able to stand up on their own and the readers can understand the data in a condensed and logical manner. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure you all have done this at some point. A lot of people will just, you know, when they see a paper, they're quick, they'll quickly go look at the figures without even like reading the paper properly. So you want to you want to make sure that the figures are, are solid, both in terms of the, the way that you presented the data and then also like your figure legends um, can be a really good way to um, kind of get the point across. Uh, obviously, you're not doing any interpretation of data in the results section, um, but, um, you know, they, they can still be very, very informative. Um, especially in terms of you can include in the figure legend like specific pieces of, of the methods, like what, you know, um, what type of like modality or, you know, technology did you use to capture that data? Was it electron microscopy? Was it confocal microscopy? Was it, you know, 3D live cell imaging? All these kinds of different things. Um, all right, so um, along with your figures and tables, most papers uh, require a written description of the data. Um, and the key point here is to be brief and to not interpret the data at all. And so the do's, um, I kind of talked about these already, um, include the overall main trends, um, mention key values, um, include appropriate units and reference the correct figures and tables um, that, you're, that you're including in that sentence. Um, don't comment on each data point, um, don't interpret the data, don't discuss the methodology. And again, obviously, I'm sure you've all learned this by now, uh, don't throw around the word significant um, unless you mean statistical significance. 
All right, discussion. Okay, so the discussion is reserved for explaining what your data means. And this is your chance to interpret the data, analyze what it means and um, express its importance. So the easiest way to start with your discussion is to start by stating whether the results do support your original hypothesis or prediction. Um, next, you wanna explain what the data shows and why. And so for this, you wanna keep the following ideas in mind. Um, so you wanna compare your results to what was found in the literature, point to any relationships, correlations, or exceptions to the general trend. And again, the discussion is where you're gonna link things back to some of the stuff you talked about in your intro. So all that kind of literature that you mentioned in terms of how, where the field is now, where that topic is now, um, you're gonna link back to those things and say, okay, this is what our paper is adding to the literature. This is what our paper is challenging um, in the literature, things like that. Um, this is how our paper is different from you know, what has been done previously, or um, this is how our paper uh, is similar or not similar to, to particular uh, uh, publications. Um, and again, find refer references to support your explanation. So if you're interpreting your data in a particular way, you want to obviously be able to find other papers that can back up your claim. Um, not papers per se that have the same finding, but papers that can, let's say you're describing like a biological phenomenon, you know, other papers that have um, commented on uh, 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 some of the underlying reasoning for, for, for a particular phenomenon. Um, uh, obviously don't discuss irrelevant topics, uh, don't redefine terms that have already been introduced, um, and do not cite, cite random references. Um, I know some people have a tendency to just toss in references and hope that no one is looking, but, but people do check your references, at least in the, in the academic world, so please don't, please don't do that. Um, and yeah, so uh, the main elements of a strong paper are being clear, concise, and accurate. And <clears throat> I would encourage you to use technology to your advantage. Um, all right, so just kind of, uh, I'm gonna wrap up these next few slides very quickly, and then I wanna leave some time for questions at the end. Sorry if I talked a little bit fast. Um, I can stay an extra, you know, whatever, however many minutes if you guys have questions about, about anything. Um, related to the present presentation or, or not related to the presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Um, yeah, so how to work towards publication at some fellowship. Um, we have some materials online that you can visit to learn uh, about um, how to submit a paper to our journal. Um, and there's plenty of other opportunities um, that we have at STEM Fellowship Journal, um, uh, or sorry, we have a ton of other ways that you can eventually get a publication to STEM Fellowship Journal. Um, uh, you can do a consulting program. Um, we have writing challenges. Uh, we have scholarly writing workshops like this one. Um, we have a science communication blog where you can kind of practice your academic writing skills. And then we also have a scholarly writing challenge. Also, I should have mentioned at the beginning, uh, I'm an associate editor for STEM Fellowship Journal. That's why I'm talking to you today. I didn't mention how I'm involved with STEM Fellowship. So maybe I should have mentioned that. Um, and if you wanna have contact for more information or support, um, you can uh, uh, contact or email Gurman. Uh, she's the chief of science communication. Um, she's the one who asked me to do this presentation. And these are some of the workshop, some workshops we've hosted. Um, and there's another one coming up uh, on March 12th, which is to uh, how to start your first manuscript. Um, and yeah, follow us on social media um, to stay updated and sign up. Hopefully this was a good workshop. Um, and now I will take any questions from you all. Let me know if anyone has questions. Please don't be shy. There's no stupid questions. I'll stop sharing here one sec. Um, I actually had a question about alt metrics. So I've, I've heard quite a bit about it before, but essentially just to clarify what it is, is that it counts like the number of times uh, like a certain publication or report has been shared, not just through the literature, like through ac academic sources, but also through um, like other social media sources. But how exactly do they count that if you have any idea? Because a lot of people can share something. Is it only like exclusive to like scholars sharing it through social media or anyone? Um, that's a good question. So yes, you did interpret it correctly. That that is what it is. Um, it's it's pretty much 
any kind of like mention of it on Twitter or uh, any other public forum. As for how it counts, um, well, things are given an alt alt metric score, so it's so I'm not sure how that's specifically calculated, but it's not like one mention is is one uh, alt metric uh, uh, point or score. Basically, um, if you hover over an alt metric score, it'll actually kind of break down like. Um, you know, X number of Twitter mentions or X number of people are talking about this on whatever. So um, it'll further define kind of where it's been talked about and things like that, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions for anyone? Sure, yeah, I'll share my email. Sorry, just tell me let me check here. I think that's my email. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Any other questions about like publishing or, um, you know, yeah, really anything about academics? Uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, it would have been nice to spend some time more on like what the actual process is of like submitting a paper and like how that actually kind of works. But I think this is a good intro uh, to, to what kind of the content of, of an academic uh, article is. Um, I actually had a question as well. Um, sure. It's kind of like, off topic, I don't know how, okay, I'll just say the question. But um, so in case you wanted to approach maybe like a professor or some type of associate had maybe some type of project that they were looking to hire undergrads for and they requested a cover letter for it. So in that cover letter, would you include maybe just proof that you've read some of their past work into the cover letter or would you just focus it mainly on skills that you can deliver to the project? Um, that's a great question. So in my experience and maybe things have changed mm -hmm. and I don't know, maybe in my experience, an investigator will not ask for a cover letter uh, for a like, especially like from an undergraduate or someone who's just looking to kind of help out with projects as like a research assistant or something like that, um, unless you're applying specifically for, for a job. And so if you're applying for uh, a job, let's say, yes, you'd be required to write a cover letter. In that cover letter, um, you know, it, it would be a good idea to have a couple of lines about um, what, you know, interests you about working with them in particular. I think that goes to show for most cover letters um, you don't have to talk about uh, specific publications that you read of theirs or anything like that. Um, but obviously, I think, you know, typically um, in, in a cover letter, you want it the, most of the attention to be focused on you and kind of what kind of skills you have, um, uh, especially in a lab setting, for example, you know, yeah. if you have, if you've had some exposure to certain techniques, um, some wet lab techniques, things like that, it's okay to mention those in your cover letter that you have experience with like PCR and things like this, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then obviously, uh, you know, expressing um, kind of how that fits in kind of your, into your long-term goal, goals and things like that. Um, is, have you, has someone ever asked you for a cover letter just kind of for like a, like a volunteer position or anything like that? Uh, so, um... Usually, uh, so at UTM, we have a, an ROP program. And basically okay. it's where like a series of just profess professors would list certain projects that we, that they would offer to students okay. um, in the upcoming semester. And usually most of them ask for like a CV slash resume and a cover letter. Okay. So um, okay. yes, sometimes like we've received questions such as like, oh, what do you put in those cover letters? You just okay. make okay. yourself look good or do you actually show that you've read some of their articles? Yeah, know, so I, think, I think it's all, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as an undergraduate student, it's it's good to, um, at the end of the day, like, this, this might be kind of um, 